The following interview was conducted with uh, Professor William LeBeau, Professor Emeritus in Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, October 23, 2008 in the Dean's Conference Room at Purdue and, and Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Well, it's good to be here, Katie. Thank you. Tell yeah. us where you, about where you were when born, where you were born, your parents and siblings in early years. Okay, my, I guess I was a breech birth. My mother always said I was slow in coming. I always use that as rationalization why, for my behavior sometimes. But uh, actually, my mother uh, was widowed when my brother was four, I was 22 months, and my sister was seven months old. And he had no insurance except $50 insurance policy. So mother went to work right away. I think my dad died in October, she went to work in November. And she worked for the telephone company for 35 years. Tell us where you were born. I was born in Chicago. And uh, St. Allen's Hospital. I can remember my mother, before she died, she they was taken to the hospital because she and was they asked, when were you here last? When were you in the hospital last? She said, when when she was born, she born my sister, which was 85 years earlier, or 88 years earlier. So um, mother had, had always been a very hardworking person. In fact, when she was in the eighth grade at St. Mel High School in Chicago, her last sister died, her oldest sister died, and she was a breadwinner for her family, her mother, her, her younger sister and her. So she had to lie about her age to get a job in the eighth grade. When my dad died, she was about 35 and the Talman company was hiring new people. They didn't want to hire anybody under 34. But she had to lie about her age again. And that was one of the things we grew up with. My mother was a hard worker. And we grew up, I guess, just before the stock market crashed, my dad died. And mother took a work uh, telephone company, the Illinois Bell Telephone Company. She worked there 35 years. I think she only missed one day of existence. And that was an example all of us kids had to follow. I remember when I was, my sister and I both had, had perfect attendance medals through grade school. And when I was in high school, my senior year, I got appendicitis. And mother was just madder than hell because I was going to miss Classes. I'm trying to get this. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, one of the things that happened to me is that I went to a Catholic high school in Chicago. It was a military school, St. Mel's High School. And uh, I remember going out for the band, and I wanted to say, well, What instrument are you playing? Well, that's what you're supposed to do. They said, You go up to the drum and bugle corps, maybe they can help you there. And they couldn't play a drum or a bugle, so they made me the drum major. And that's what was my job. I got a lot of pictures that I used to learn how to jump. In fact, my legs were real short when I was a kid. And so I'd have to take two steps and they always, my mother looked out the window. They said, bring the drumming bugle court past my house. And she'd look out the window and say, he's the only one in step. Because yeah. of my leg. I'm going to stop for a second on this. I want to double check. Had been in the Army. And I, she wanted me to go to college. So my mother went to local loan. Borrowed money for me to go to local, go to St. Mary's College in Winona, Minnesota. It was a CB Christian Brothers School, and the novitiate was in Winona. So I went there my first year, and while I was there, I remember I was joined the Navy Reserve. And the reason why I joined the Navy is because they are, they could always trade you, train you for some kind of trade if it didn't work out at college. And I remember when I was called there, I was called to active duty, but I had to go to a medical exam first in Minneapolis. So I remember going up there and borrowing a pair of glasses, because my eyesight wasn't the greatest, and borrowing from a prefect in the school there at St. Mary's College. And I passed the eye test and I was able to go to the Navy. So I was in the Navy. And, you know, the Navy needed a lot of officers, and so they made us, uh, you know, not 90-day warranters, but 
we had to go to school around the year, so it only took me two years to finish college up. I had my first year at St. Mary's. In two years, I had to finish three years because we went all year round. When I was finished, I was supposed to go to midshipman school at Notre Dame, but my asthma was so bad that they gave me a medical discharge. I remember going to Great Lakes Hospital and saying, well, I lady, you gave me an education, so why I probably be willing to work with the president? Maybe it's I was psycho or something. Anyway, I was medically discharged. The medical discharge from the Navy then. I went to Bex and to Minneapolis, and I had met my wife, my wife now, Donna, uh, earlier, and uh, that was from a very interesting thing. One of my buddies and I had her picture, and I said, "I want to meet that girl." And somehow, after calling her about 15 times, she finally agreed to meet me. And we dated. And she was a Lutheran, I was a Catholic. And for a while, some question about whether we were marriage or didn't take. But she um, took catechism lessons, and I had none to my knowledge. I would insist on it. She decided she'd become a Catholic. We were married in Incarnation Church. I guess I graduated Minnesota. See, I was about a month before I was to graduate. The Navy called me to send me to the Great Lakes Hospital. But I had passed all my courses. They gave me my degree anyway. I went back for my graduation in June from the Great Lakes Hospital. And, and I was discharged in late July. What, well, um, what year was, was 1945. It? Okay. And Don and I were married in August of 1945. And uh, I took a job at Automatic Electric Company, which is a company I had worked for when I was a teenager during the war. I had worked in assembly lines in summer, summer jobs. And I was assistant engineer and hired that way. And I remember I experienced it. Automatic Electric was one that worked for independent telephone companies. It was sort of competition for the Bell system. My mother and other was thought I shouldn't have stayed with the Bell system. I did have an offer for them. But I make electric seem like a better place for me. And while I was there, one of my friends said, you know, they got a new job open at the University of Illinois. Why don't you apply over there? Well, I never thought of myself as a teacher at all. But it was kind of an interesting idea. So I went over for the last to get an interview. I thought it was one of the worst interviews I ever had. But somehow, I, my wife and I had moved out to Park Forest, which is a new community in South Chicago. There were only 100 people in the community then. We were about the 100th resident. And uh, what happened was, I got a postcard saying, come to the next faculty meeting. That's how I knew I was hired. I walked in. And they gave me, they said, okay, is this they want a me to teach electrical engineering. At Champaign, Urbana? No, this was, this was the, uh, Navy the Pier. University of Illinois opened a branch in Navy Pier because so many GIs were coming back. After the war. After the war. They wanted. I went to my first class, and I only weighed about 125 pounds. I've never been very tall. I was the youngest person in the class. I was the shortest. And the lightest, I only weighed about 125 pounds then. And I had to teach this course. One of the first jobs I had to do was to read a little, I will say, no smoking on campus. And one guy in the back row, I remember him saying, is this what I fought in Quad Canal for? <laughs> well, it was a fun thing. And I really, what were you teaching? Well, that's an interesting thing. They, taught, they hired me because I was an electrical engineer. But well, it what turned out, it turned out that the first course in electrical engineering in the University of Illinois was a course in lighting design. I had never had a course in that in my life. I asked them for the book. They said, we don't have the book, but we'll get it here next month. So I went to the Creole Library in Chicago and got a hold of the book. I saved a chapter ahead of them. We got the books about the middle of the semester. So I had to teach a course I had never had in before. It was a funny experience, and I loved the job. And I guess the students love me too. Because I organized a chapter of what was then called AIE, American Institute of Electrical Engineers. 
And while I was there, one of my mentors was Dean Bill Everett at Illinois in Urbana. And he had merged the industrial IRE and the AIE with electrical engineering into one organization. Of course, I didn't know a lot about lighting, but lighting design was very interesting to me. And so I got into that. And so uh, what happened was I didn't know much about vision, so I had to learn all about vision. And one of the books I ran across was one by a guy named Matthew Lucas, who you might know, Katie. I think your family didn't know. And I, he was, had written a book on the physiology and psychology of vision. And I learned a lot from that. And I taught a course for architects and engineers. So it was very interesting. Architects could always design things beautifully. They had turned into the best looking drawings. But their math was always off. They'd try and use one fixture to light a room uh, where you need 100 foot candles for seeing. And the engineers would get the math right, but their drawings were always straight and narrow. And it was a very interesting. I remember uh, that experience. Anyway, I, I got into the Illumina Engineering Society. That's the one time I did meet Matt, Matt Dr. Lucas. He had been a physicist, physics major at, at Purdue. One of the reasons why I wrote, and I, in the meantime, I decided I better go you could stay in academic work, you had to have an advanced degree. I just had a bachelor's degree. So I went to Northwestern and commuted around the world in miles. I went over 20,000 miles. But I never got out of the city of Chicago. I remember at first I was in carpools. I taught Navy Pier. We lived in Park Forest, which was about 30 miles south. So I had to do all my studying on the train. And anyway, I uh, remember more than once I go past my stop when I'm on my way home. I used to go on nights. First I went to the Chicago campus, Northwestern. Then I went to the Evanston campus, and towards the end of my work I could only get the courses in the evening. And then I went summers, I took summers off and went to school full time. And my asthma was so bad, I used to have to take a bike and ride down wow. one hill up the other so I could make it to the other thing. But it worked out, I got my master's degree. And I wrote to a number of places then when I finished up, including I didn't think I was necessarily going to stay in teaching, but I liked the job. They, one of the jobs they had given me was a job as a student counselor in engineering to talk with students on engineering in the counseling field, and I liked that job too. So I wrote to a number of schools, including Purdue, saying I'd like to get a degree in engineering education, a doctor's degree. Well, I wrote to Dean Potter. Well, by that time, Dean Potter had retired. In fact, he had been acting president, and George Hawkins had been the new dean. Just before he became a dean at, uh, at Purdue, he'd taken a sabbatical off in the practice. Either before or after you retire, you take a sabbatical. He took a sabbatical at UCLA, and they had a new idea of a unified engineering program, and they wanted to merge. There was a movement on to make engineering more liberal education. They wanted to have a unified engineering program. So I even had some psychologists on their staff at, at uh, UCLA to work on the transition program and so work on so dealt with very interesting problems that would have an impact on society. So George thought he got this letter from this guy. He wanted to get it. so he called Herman Remmers, who was the head of educational reference. He was a very wonderful man, a Renaissance man in a way. Uh, he uh, was uh, in World War One he was a uh, working for General Electric Company, and he uh, got interested in psychology and education. He worked, went to University of Iowa and got his doctorate. And while he was there, we made a lot of friends, including a guy named um, Gallup. And Gallup and he were good friends. And so Henry, Henry Remmers, Herman Remmers, started the Purdue Opinion Panel 
which was a high school poll, there's a lot of evidence that children, especially adult uh, teenagers, had values very similar to their, their parents. So he has idea, well, if, well if we can get the, the kids, we can do the polls. And those polls went on for many years. They started before I got there. But, uh, and so he was a poll expert. And he also was uh, an industrial engineer, and he was an educational psychologist. He was a really Renaissance man. He spoke German, French. He learned a lot of those languages, and he used to be able to speak in about four or five different languages. Anyway, he was uh, on the faculty here, and he had a lot of influence. He was my major professor. So you came to Purdue to do your uh, doctorate? Yeah, work? I had an interview here, and they disliked all the things I was interested in doing. But Herman said, I don't think right now education is very well respected, even though he was a professor of education and psychology. He said, I think you'll grow, it'll be more viable around here. I got a degree in psychology. Well, I had taken some psych courses, and I liked them at, at Northwestern. I had a minor in psych there. I was making a transition. Well, I found that, that going from engineering to psychology was fairly easy. At least the statistics that all the psychology majors were having trouble with were very easy for us. Math was very simple-minded, I thought. I had taken a lot of math when I was in high school. Almost every electrical engineering course you took in your senior year and your graduate work was started with vector analysis. And they would all say, hey, how many know how about vector analysis? And of course, they didn't know. Somebody would raise their hand, so you always got a course <laughs> vector analysis over and over again. Anyway, what happened was they said, well, we'll hire you and you'll work as a research assistant in engineering education once you have a rank of instructor. Now, so what wanted, year did you come to Purdue then? What year I came this to Purdue. What year about with this? It was in 1954. I got my master's degree in Northwestern in the summer of, of 1953. And I was uh, promoted from instructor to assistant professor immediately. So I started there as assistant professor. And I started as an instructor in 47. And then I went. This is this at in 53 at Illinois. Illinois. And as I mentioned, I had, gone, I had contact with Dean Everett, who was the dean of engineering at, at uh, Illinois, Urbana. And he became a good friend and a mentor of mine for many years. It was the second mentor, was the Dean of Engineering. When I came to Purdue then, I got to know Dean Parr very well. In fact, as he uh, got older, he was called the Dean of Deans. Engineering, a wonderful man, so warm and friendly. And uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but he and President Elliott usually have little battles with each other. I remember during the Depression, um, I guess Dean Elliot, President Elliot was concerned about all the leaves of absence that people were taking on travel. He said, well, we can't afford to be. And he was elected president of the ASME that year. And he was concerned about the people not having jobs. So he said, that's all right. He said, I won't ever ask you for another penny for travel. So he went over to the bank and took an account out. And he paid for all of his travel. Who, Potter? Potter did. After that. Well, he used to be, this is a story, you know. These things get distorted sometimes in banks. But he paid all for all of his travel while the rest of the time he was under President Elliott. President Elliott was a very autocratic man. He was a wonderful man. I got to meet him. He used to have an office over in Hubsey. Oh, they call Hubsey Hall. It was now what it was called. Executive building, wasn't Executive it? Executive building, yeah. I think, before that. Anyway, um, one of the interesting things that happened to me there is that uh, I guess Dean Hawkins had a lot of new ideas for what he wanted to do. And he wrote something called 12 Elements in the design of an engineering education. Became a classic for many of us, the revolution. And it became, he said, now, I'm going to set up a new department of freshman engineering. 
And Al Spaulding, who was one of the counselors in mechanical engineering, all the students always went to him for information. He signed DuPont in the year of industry this year. And when he comes back, I want you to work for him. I want you to work in my office. I want you to work for Herman Remmers. We'll pay for part of your salary. So we split. Well, at first it was just was a, a research appointment was in engineering education, but engineering paid for my citizenship. I want you to do two, three things. He said, I want you to work on the transition of freshman year. Attrition were very high then. In fact, they used steam power. You say, I'd say, look to the left of you, look to the right of you. From now on, only one of you will graduate in engineering from Purdue. And that was pretty much, well, the attrition were very high. It's tough programs, and they became more scientific, and people needed better preparation. It would be very different. And Purdue was, of course, a land grant school, and anybody could come to Purdue. There were no admission requirements as long as you graduated from an accredited high school. And so I want you to work with freshmen and work on attrition. He says, the other thing is, a lot of people say, what happens to our graduates? I want you to do a study of what happens to our graduates. He said, the other thing is, the new program, a lot of new faculty coming in. A lot of the old guard, faculty had different ideas. I want to help them get the transition into the new university. I want you to work on that. And that was my three assignments I was given to work on. Well, the first thing I did was do, well, when I, it turns out when I was doing my graduate work, it was very easy to do my PhD because I had lots of research studies. You're doing a PhD here at Purdue? PhD. I changed instead of education, I did in psychology, in general psych. About that time, the psych department decided that engineers, I mean psychology majors, again, PhDs ought to have very broad education to it. They take a test in the history of psychology, a test in test of measurements and statistics. One in adolescent, uh, one in child psychology and one in clinical psychology. Well, I had had only a few of those courses. I had really blown up. I took a course in, uh, from John Hadley in abnormal psych, and I took some courses from a gal named Harriet O'Shea. They called her, she was a very tough person. She used to call Paper a Day O'Shea. She asked her students to write a paper every time they come in. Anyway, it was a tough thing, but I, I learned a lot. I was able to pass a qualifying exam. And one of the people that they joined the faculty was a guy named Ben Moiner. Ben Moiner was a very known statistical psychologist, known for work he'd done in factor analysis and in multivariate uh, analysis of psychological data. Well, I signed up for his course, and only two of us signed up for the course. Another guy who was in, I was a fellow from, I think his name was Kurtz, it was Ken Kurtz or Ed Kurtz, uh, and myself. And we each had a calculator, and Ben would come in, he had a calculator too. These are uh, the big calculators, right? These are big hand calculators. Oh, okay. And what we had to do, we had to find the rank of a matrix was the idea. And then once you got in that rank of a matrix, you might have something that be a 120 by 120 matrix, but there were really only 10 major factors you had to find out which were the independent factors. In order to do that, you had to rotate things. He did it all by hand. I remember Ben had to help me doing my rotations. Now it's all done mathematically. And that had a lot of impact on me. So when I was going to write my, my thesis, that's another thing where Herman Remmers was great. He had been on the advisory committee to the Educational Testing Service. So he took me along to quite a few of their meetings. They used to have Educational Testing Service meetings. They used to have a, once a year they'd have a, a guru conference. And he went along with it. And so I learned how to do tests. So when I was going to write my thesis, it was very easy. I had done some pre and post tests on the math proficiency of engineers. 
had done something on their English proficiency, something on their knowledge of physical science, because you should give a physical science test. And then we also, um, and one of the things I did was look at pre-post testing. There was a big breakthrough then uh, in testing and retesting. It was what they call regression phenomena. If you retest a group, if the measuring instrument is not very reliable, they always recess to the mean. They always rescore close to the mean. They had to connect with them. So I could find what the true changes were. Well, this is a long story. On my, on my uh, committee, my doctoral committee was three people. Herman Remus was the chairman, a fellow named Downey, who also was one of my mentors in measurement. Uh, and Ben Weiner was on my committee. And then for the electrical engineering part of it, a guy named, uh, who was in, had written a book, had been in chairman of engineering education for Billy. He was an electrical engineering professor, and he was the, got me electrical engineering as a minor. But my major was general psych, a minor in math, and a minor in, in uh, electrical engineering. And went through very well. I remember Ben, ben Weiner just gave me a whole lot of terms and said, tell me what each one of these terms meant. And so, anyway, I, I would survive that and I graduated. It took me almost 10 years, almost seven years to get my master's degree in Northwestern Community. Well, it took me two and a half years, just like the bachelor's degree, to get my PhD. But you were commuting, and that was more difficult at the master's. That's you know? right. And you were working at first, full time. When I first went back to college, I guess it was GI Bill helped me there. They paid for me, and then I got an extra hundred dollars a month because I was taking a heavy enough load so that they would pay my pay me out some subsistence. That's how I made it. When I went to the University of Illinois, I got raised. I came to Purdue. I got to take a cut, but we figured our our cost of living would be a lot less and living here. And in fact, we, I took my money from our retirement and what we saved coming here, even though I took a, five, a couple thousand dollar cut salary. We saved enough so we could buy a house. Where about did you live when you first came here then? When we, we lived in black and whites first. And uh, then we moved, bought a house over on Carlisle Road. We were just outside the city then. In fact, our kids, my boy, my oldest boy was probably in first and second grade. I was in second grade, and my daughter was in first grade when we came here. And we went to St. Mary's at first. The bus used to stop in front of our door, and they get on the bus, and they come back in the bus. We didn't have a car then at all. How'd you get to school? Carpools. I, I guess, yeah, yeah, that's what happened. What happened was, I think when we lived in Park Forest, we had an old junker for a while. That broke down. We came here, I think we had borrowed a, a car from her, her brother anyway. Long story, it doesn't matter, not very relevant. And um, anyway, by the time we moved out to, it was outside the city limits, so our, uh, we decided that the schools, the community was too hard. We moved to the new house. And we thought it was going to come back in the city anyway, so the kids went to Klondike for one year. And it was taken in the city and they went to Burst. And the kids all went through. And our son, the youngest son, Tom, was born in the new house on Kyle Road. And uh, so I got started. Things were tough then. We didn't have a lot of money. I remember I used to take the car and I'd get on Northwestern and I'd turn the ignition off and I could coast all the way down the street to the campus to park. And uh, that's, uh, it was kind of funny. But it worked out real well. 
And all the projects that Dean, that Dean offered to set out for me were non fruition. We actually. Where was the, where was your, were you located? Well, we, e, were we you in ENAD? Those. Was the department in ENAD where Defense Professional Engineering, is that where your office was? Originally, I was in Educational Reference, which was up in the third floor. Of ENAD? Of ENAD. And uh, then the dean's office was down on the first floor mm -hmm. in the PAR. It wasn't called the PAR. No, it's e Library. Engineering Administration. That building wasn't even built then. Right. In fact, some of the stories he used to tell about Dean Hawkins is that he used to he used to go swimming in the in the uh, uh, he used to have a big uh, water tower in the back of the thing, and he used to have to, to keep water in a big thing that was in where the parking lot is there. And he used to was caught swimming in there, and Dean Hawkins had to had to appear before Dean Power. And, Explain why he was doing it. He used to climb the chimneys and take temperatures off of the chimneys. He used to say, some people call that a phonic symbol. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, what happened was the three jobs that they gave me to do one was the faculty development program, and there we had two parts. I worked with other people in the university and the dean of education and boy well, was head of the department became the first dean. Our department head, our division was uh, a guy. And we set up an orientation pack program for new faculty. I don't know if it still exists or not. But they, we found they needed to know about how, who the people were, the, how they get to the library, how they got their books and how they got all those things. And we had set up an orientation. First day or two on campus, a couple hours every day. The other part was a seminar where which Dean Power had offered himself before that. And I had guest speakers come in. I'd have Dean Howard to come in, talk about 12 elements of education. I would have President Hubby come over. It was very nice. In fact, President Hubby was very good in small groups. He wasn't such a great speaker in large groups, but he was a wonderful. This was small for group. faculty. The seminar was for faculty. It was for faculty for new faculty. New faculty, okay. New faculty, and uh, I think a lot of people I remember on the faculty now uh, or were then probably retired by now. Mm -hmm. That was quite a few. That was in. We started those in 1955, and we carried them out for about seven years, or 10 years after that. I went on leave, well, after I got my doctorate, I had offers from quite a few schools, MIT offering something, Wisconsin offering Michigan State, and some of them offered me associate professorship, because I had already been assistant professor in Illinois. So, Purdue said, well, we'll be that set. So I was able to get appointed after my PhD as associate professor. Did that come with tenure? Oh, no, well, with tenure. Well, no, I think then you had to have at least one year as associate professor. Of course, it wasn't long after that. About this time, Tom Jones came in as the head of electrical engineering. I had taught electrical engineering at Illinois, not just the illuminating engineering. I taught circuits courses there. Anyway. What happened was Tom wanted us to get to know the student better, so I kept a little diary on each one of my students. So when I was, I had been just doing research at first, he said, well, you gotta teach something to get promoted. You had to have two strengths. Research was not a problem, but, but teaching might be. So I taught that course, and he was so pleased with that. He was one of my strongest supporters. And uh, so, the jobs that we did then is we, uh, one job was the faculty seminar, fa faculty development for new faculty, and that was the orientation program, and the second part was the seminar where you get to know, we bring somebody in on learning, we bring, uh, we used to have Downey come in on testing, how to make tests and measurements. We had a professor of higher education and come in and Professor Alexander, whose uh, daughter is um, 
Paul Woods does the history of stuff. He was a great history of edu higher education. And I used to, um, and we'd have somebody come in on problem solving. And it was once a week, and I carried that out for almost 15 years after. I think when I finally, I think I went on leave to, to uh, UCLA, one of the assistant deans took it over, and I took it back uh, when I got back. And then when I went on leave, by that time, uh, I was pretty much into other things. I didn't, I, th I, don't, know, I don't think, I, didn't. I think orientation program is still on. I don't think they have a seminar anymore. They have new seminars now that are much better than <laughs> what maybe I are. And I well, anyway, that was one of the jobs. The second job was to, was freshman engineering. And what we did there, and Jim Burney, who's one of the people who helped me on that, was we thought we were doing a lot of status quo research, what we call what was the correlation between math tests and how well they did in math. They always had kind of a general placement. They give them a math test and they come in and they decide whether well, you should start at algebra or you start at trig or maybe you can go into analytical geometry. But they were never quite sure how to do that. And what we did, we collected a lot of information and we started to find out better ways of placing kids in beginning courses. So we, uh, and what we did is we used a statistical model and we would look at students uh, separately. Math was not always the same as chemistry. Math was critical, but chemistry was important. Some other things were important for chemistry. English was something else. And we didn't take physics in the freshman year, so we didn't do much on physics. So we looked out techniques for identifying who what math course they should be in. And if they did take it, were they likely to get an A or a B or a C in that course? And if they went to the next level in course, the next level. And we would work out probabilities of what they were almost like called a technique is called discriminant analysis. And that was a technique we used. And uh, we found it was very effective in placing students. I got the award for helping students learn mm -hmm. for that work I did. I'm trying to, often we play students in the right math course, English course, and later on we worked on what was the best computer course to place them in. Of course, English was never a problem, much of a problem. Even though the engineering students were not strong in verbally as they were mathematically, their verbal scores were still above the university average. So it wasn't really a problem. We did, Jim and I did some study to find out the kids with the high verbals often ended up out of engineering. And usually you had to have about a standard deviation higher and more <coughs> if they stayed in engineering. But they would not stop by the university. Well, towards the end of my career here, I did some other studies on, which in this story I told you about look to left or your own. I can say look to left of you two people, look to right of you two people. Four of the five of you can graduate from Purdue. The other one might be your boss, because our find, our studies of follow up studies of graduates, found that some of those people left, but they took became ministers, or they might become change their major to management or something else. So mm -hmm. they weren't all. So they actually graduate a lot more than statistically they show. Mm -hmm. I think that's so true. So that was one of the. Th Things I was work with freshmen, and we did improve the attrition factors quite a bit. Not only in engineering, but now we had technology programs and management programs were developed, so there was something else they could transfer to. And uh, made a transition. We didn't consider them only failures if they left either. Some of our best students might leave to go to a naval academy or something like that. So uh, anyway. Bill, talk was about that, uh, your Purdue interest questionnaire. Oh, the, yeah. the pick was well, one researchers of Researchers will appreciate that. Why, well, Jim and I worked on that, and Jim Barron and I worked on that a little bit. What I had found is interest tests were not very good things to measure academic achievement. 
you can have a high interest in something but not wouldn't affect your grades any. But we did find that when you followed up people that had interest similar to the people in that occupation, they were more likely to stay in that occupation. And if they stayed in the occupation, they had a lot more to be satisfied. If their interests were common to people in that. Well, that's what most of the research had said. And I, but then we could never get different fields of engineering that way. And I ran across a, a study that uh, a gal, I think it was at Ohio State, did. Her name was Molly McCampbell. And she used, instead of having uh, men and women in general as a reference group, she had engineers in general. And she looked at electrical, and she could make fairly good differentiation by, by some of the fields of engineering that way. Well, in our alumni studies, we had found out a lot more about what engineers did and what they liked to do. And so we gave those to graduates. And we were able to collect a lot of information about what the mechanical engineers did and liked more than as compared to chemical. Also, another important thing we found out was engineering function, research, development, design, operation, management, sales. Those were all functions. Of and also levels. Some people had very high levels of responsibility, some had low. But usually it was men. So we developed, we made a new questionnaire up called the Purdue Interest Questionnaire from the, these things we had from engineers describing their jobs. And we did a little test and we made the reference sample beginning freshman in engineering science and technology and management was a reference group. And then we looked at electrical, those that graduated in electrical engineering mechanical or were already out in electrical engineering. That's how we did it. We were very successful in developing things. And of course, I don't know whether they use it anymore or not, but at one time, that was a standard we used to help students. We had a lot of, about 25 of students would be on this. In most cases, Students came in and they have a pretty good idea of what they want to do. They might be sure what's going to be electrical or computer engineering or mechanical or aeronautical, but they know something like that. Okay. And so we found that we could help students make decisions based on their interests. Was never was never any good for we did the studies. We did what I found we didn't affect their grades at all. The cognitive things are better for that. But the affective area there was very useful. Now, as computers came in, then of course we had to worry about computers. Some people were programming computers and everything, and others had never even held a computer before. We had different levels of computer. We developed a computer development survey for that. We did some more work on chemistry. We did a chemical chemistry uh, analogy test, and we developed. Uh, so that was what I did in that area. Now, another thing I might mention is the other areas I worked in were women in engineering. That's my next question. Uh, when I came here, less than 1% of the students were women, and most of them did get engineering and were out. Only about one in 10 of those started in engineering were in there. So we tried to find out why. Al Spalding, was very interested in that thing because he had a daughter who was thought might she never went into engineering. We thought she had a lot of talent that way too. And I remember we uh, finally decided that we ought to do something about recruiting because after in the in the after the I guess it was probably in the seventies, engineering enrollments were plunging. I said, Well why don't you have any women in there? And then people were saying, Well you talk about equal opportunities, you don't have any minorities in engineering, at least not African Americans. And so the women's movement came first, and we did a lot of work in trying to recruit women to come in. And I think some of the first programs were run. We had one professor we hired from Stanford, and she started the women in engineering program. And uh, and I think after that, uh, it was a uh, fellow named Marie Kaniga 
She was worked for Helen Potter over, she was our major professor over in uh, home economics and she got interested in this project and we hired her. We had a, the wife of one of the professors in mechanical engineering, was the name Smith, she came in and helped. And then uh, of course Jane Daniels came along and she really put the program on the map. And uh, under Harold Amron, Harold Amron was a wonderful man, and he was the head of industrial engineering. And when we had different deans coming in in the meantime, and one of the deans had wanted him to set up freshman engineering, I think it was Dean Hancock, who was the one that uh, talked him into coming over to freshman engineering. And that was about 1975. About the 70s, anyway, I think I can give you the exact dates. Anyway, he decided that we would do something to get more women in there. And we, so what he did is, is he set up, we hired a woman who had been a by, who was a professor of, her husband was here on a sabbatical, and she was a minority person. And she started the program for women. And then after that, that's when uh, other people came in. We hired the people. And uh, the minority program started very easily. Hart Bond had been a, a professor. I don't know, he had been a graduate student. In in fact, he was one of the first PhDs in electrical engineering in the country. Hart Bond who worked with freshman engineering when he was a graduate student. And he started the women engineering program. And uh, what we did first, we went out to high schools. We started to bring them in for, for workshops. We found teachers and counselors, and we found but teachers were not so important as the teachers and counselors, as the counselors were. The counselors would talk with the students and say, yeah. but we had teachers and counselors and math and science teachers would have some impact. So we started uh, minority programs and we started women's programs the same way. Summer programs. We found out we could get their test scores of SATs for seniors early, when they took in junior year. We could identify potential people with high math scores. And women often had very high math scores. We wouldn't invite them to come to us. And minorities were a similar thing, but they wouldn't have be maybe as high then as they might be now. But then their scores were lower. But we would take the ones that had strong math backgrounds, potentially. And we started working with them as earlier. We found that starting at the junior year was too late. It's to get them when they were freshmen or mm -hmm. senior, junior. So our minority program focused on seventh and eighth graders. And our women's program were focusing more on juniors in high school. About this time, I took a leave of absence. I had, I had, uh, Never taken a leave of absence, and I guess uh, we had a vice president named Paul Chino, and his idea was you should take a sabbatical every seven years, but every three years you ought to go someplace else at somebody else's expense. The first sabbatical I took was at UCLA, a year after I got my promotion to full professor. Well, it took me two years after my associate program. I had to do that teaching bit, and I had that as a secondary strength, and the research was fairly easy because not many people were publishing then, and that was really very easy to publish and get promoted. Mm -hmm. I was given papers all over. I remember in the first, well, one of my first papers I won was the Illinois, Indiana Young Engineering Teachers Contest. Was out. So my preliminary work on a longitudinal study of engineering students. 
It was fun. I tell you, Katie, when I was a freshman then, and I'm still a freshman, because you really learn a lot by working with freshmen. They're the best teachers you ever had. I'm a freshman then, I think, even now, I think when I try and pick up something new to learn, I have to start over as a freshman again. Uh, let's see, where should we go? Um, you talked about the women engineering and the minority, and then the deans. You served under some presidents too. Hupty was here when. What was the and tell us a little bit about what the campus was like in the fifties when you came. Fifties and. Well, 60s. first of all, it wasn't a near what what under. Hupty was president. When See, you first Elliot came. had been the president, and he retired, and then acting president while we were searching for, for president was Dean Parr. Correct. And before I came here, they had appointed the President Hovde. President Hovde had been working in uh, Europe as the, uh, in some of the missile, early missile work. And so he had been at the University of Minnesota before. He was a great quarterback. But he, had, he was also a good scholar, so he was a Rhodes Scholar. And so when Purdue was looking for somebody to be a dean, they, they decided on him because he was, yeah, he, they thought the new technology was going to be aeronautics or, or something like that. So they had made him, he was the youngest president, he was only about 35 when he was made president. He was the youngest president. Uh, of the Big Ten I ever had, I think, at that time. I don't know, that's probably not true anymore. Maybe. But anyway, he was the president. And under him, after World War II, his idea was we wanted to build and make this into a comprehensive university. He had been at the University of Minnesota, had been the dean of the general college there. And so he knew a lot about academic work. And so under after the war, there was a lot of interest in higher education. A lot more people were going to college then. And the GI Bill helped. The GI Bill helped. But then it became more of a common thing for people to go. I can remember up and around the, I've done some studies in the industrial community, like up around the steel mills in Gary, the best students would go to work in the steel mills. The next best group of students would go to college. The next best. I did some work in Appalachia in uh, some I work with North Central and similar things I found like the best students would go to work in the mines and the next best students would go to college. Well that course changed and so now the better students were going to college because the steel mills were closing, starting to close them. You know, the best students were not any good out. You know you could make very good money right away. A lot of young people, that's what they were looking for. Because mm -hmm. they all came from poor. And most of our engineers came from blue collar families back at that time. Mm -hmm. All came from, uh, usually they were pretty bright kids, but they were not, they were usually strong in math, not necessarily strong in verbally. In fact, in the early days, I think Dean Parr did his recruiting in vocational schools. Almost all. Of course, then later on, of course, now most of our students come from strong uh, suburban schools. In fact, I even stand there recruiting now in South Africa and other places, other countries, because now we compete in the worldwide pursuit. Making a comment, you're talking about the ones going to the steel mills, but a lot of them was a family thing. My father, our family had worked in the mills, and so you continued on. Same with much of the auto industry, too. You know, and in those days, it was easy to get a job being yeah. a family member. It was yeah, something sure. Like and people married younger then. Right. Oh, yeah. They had a family pretty quick, and so. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so I think that's what happened is that. I hope he came. We uh, we recruited students better prepared, but if they did come, we're now equipped a little better how to handle their math. It might take them five years. And or may, if they're really good, they might get done in three and a half or four or three years. So we now one of the big 
things that happen about this time is that Dean Hawkins and all the deans of engineering decided that engineering was going to have to be more scientific. So they did some studies about the time I came to Purdue, and engineering science became very important. And so everything got upgraded. Now you had to start in calculus, or start in analytical geometry, most of them. Now most of them come in with already having calculus. Well, I can remember our first emphasis was trying to teach them college algebra. Now if they don't know algebra, uh, we had to make provisions for that. That's why a lot of students would try to drop out, because by the time we were juniors, they wanted to know vector analysis. A pretty fast pace. All right, so a lot of them went by the wayside. The other thing that Purdue had a tradition in getting turning out graduates got things done, and that was some of the things. There was a big battle between the old guard and the new guard. Well, it should be scientific or it should be practical. And of course, the old guard would say, "Well, I remember I had a big meeting with the people who were teaching. We used to start off with a course in tool." And tools and heat treating and hands-on courses, and they had decided to drop those courses out quickly. I remember being called over for a meeting. I was one they would consult whenever there was some psychological. Something's wrong with the students. They're not, they don't have the right attitude anymore. At all. Well, they were more recruiting more people with math proficiency. Of course, part of the problem was the morale of them of the faculty was not very high that their course were being eliminated. <laughs> and more to do with it than anything else. Uh, anyway, I guess that was a big change and so I uh, think Dean I think President Hubdy had a lot to do. he wanted to make it a more comprehensive university, more like Minnesota and Michigan and Illinois and places. We were pretty much a and M type college. This was set up in Indiana was the land grant. Land, well, we were the land grant That's school, right. and they, and you know it's very interesting. I guess the other thing that made a big difference in the land grant schools were the ones that they had to admit women to, and they had a lot to do with why women went to college. We never were able to get many of them. We used to have a separate home economics department. The girls would all go to home economics, and the boys would go. To engineering or agriculture. Now, of course, it's different. The best school growing up, I remember um, when the speech and hearing clinic was set up here, I remember uh, the President Hubby was there as well. He said, well, one of the best facilities in the whole Midwest for hearing and speech and hearing clinic. And he said, oh, just use it. They went to the best school. School started here. Mm -hmm. That was the ag part of it, the scientific move of this. And then the management school started here. And we found a lot of engineers want to transfer to either industrial engineering, which really wasn't, they didn't want to be just management. They, wanted, they, they were, wanted to be true engineers. You know? Big, big debate on those lines. So I think under President Hubdy, it grew very, very large and very comprehensive. He got the facilities for us. We started to point faculty now. Used to be a, a master's degree was all that was required and maybe a professional engineering license. Now PhDs became very important. And so that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how about the President's Council? Were you involved in that? I wasn't, no, I think oh. I, I wasn't very much involved. Okay. I think under President Hansen, Got people more student oriented, right. being more student oriented. This yeah. was, uh, you made a comment in your suggested comment in the engineering versus science versus technology. Did you want to make a comment on that or? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, engineering was going more scientific. Okay. And t technology school was only a two year program. When it got started? When it got started. In fact, most of them were at the regional campuses. That's where. The growth was because they wanted people in the industry areas, like in Gary area, or in Indianapolis or Evansville. They wanted people with degrees, but they wanted four-year degrees. Two years was plenty. 
and they had a reputation, and Purdue had a reputation of getting things done. Like we used to have a plumbers and pipe fitters convention here. I think my wife, one of her first jobs was working on that convention when, when she was a graduate student here. Yeah. They haven't been here in a long time. So anyway, what happened was, and I think talking about presidents, people that had a lot of, and Dean Lawshey made a big difference. Dean Lawshey, when he was a, uh, made Dean of Extension, he had been an industrial and engineering guru. And what he did under his leadership is he said, well, why do we have a separate course in English and math for technology, for engineers and tech, uh, for technology students? Why shouldn't they take the same English course? And big breakthrough was getting credit at the regional campuses that were in vocational programs. Of course, the North Central Association came along and they insisted that you ought to be able to transfer. Some, some states even made it mandatory that all the college credits from from Green College had to transfer. Now, President Hubby, I often asked him why he didn't want Green College and he'd get very mad like it did in Washington. He said, well, we got the regional campus, we do those, both of them. So that was essentially our community college or regional college. And of course, later on, we developed the technical institutes Ivy Tech, things like that. That was a, to take care of. So a lot of the stuff they take in Ivy Tech used to be engineering courses. And of course, they never wanted, it's still a problem of getting the, um, uh, well, no question but what, science was making more of an impact on engineering. It used to be that uh, master's degree was maybe as high as most engineers went. Now, at least, 10 to 15 percent get to go on for the PhD, and most of them get master's degrees now. Most of the recent graduates have at least a master's degree. One of the studies I worked on was the Goals of Engineering Education Project. That was one where we said the master degree ought to be the first professional engineering degree. All hell broke loose, because most of the engineers only had a bachelor's degree, and they all, engineering profession rejected that pretty well. But the master's degree became very important. And then the PhD. Master's degree was primarily for people that had a bachelor's degree and wanted to get a little more education. So most of the urban centers had a good master's degree program. And here there was a stepping stone for the PhD on campus like Purdue and places like that. So the PhD had become very important. Mm -hmm. And necessity now for any academic job, and maybe postdoctoral things, they're not quite in there. We're seeing more and more postdoctoral right. things in engineering now, right. like it is in medicine now. Right. Always been a big, is engineering a profession? Another That's big right. debate would take weeks. Um, you have been very active in the American Society for Engineering Education, haven't you? Yes. Yeah. I started with the YETS program, Young Engineering Teachers Program. I mentioned I'm one of my first prize on that. And what we did, we first, we took the model that we had here for the engineering education seminars and we set up some some uh, teaching institutes that still carried on. In fact, one of the new professors at Purdue is Carl Smith and he's one of the people that uh, worked on that. We had, uh, Dean Pirate had started summer engineering schools in the summer, some in mechanical engineering, to give people a little more depth for, for faculty members. So we started these young engineering teacher institutes. Turned out a lot of mets, we call them, middle-aged teachers showed up for those. They want to know more about how to teach. And uh, Dean Pyre had always had a seminar, and I had carried on that one I mentioned, had been on. So what happened was, the Educational Methods Division, I was looking at who the members of this Educational Methods, what would that be doing in engineering? Well, it turns out that some of the people like Walker and Tier, Dean Walker was the Dean of Engineering for the state, became the president. Dick Tier was the Dean at Carnegie Tech, he was a member of that division. A lot of people like that, a guy named Charlie Vess. Who, who became son, president of MIT. Yeah, 
But he was in a, he was in business, right? He was the best with that. Anyway, what happened was was that they decided to go out and develop. And I remember sitting around. This group would meet and around. We meet around a coffee table, probably, or a, a breakfast table. And we said, "Well, we decided we were going to change the name of that division, the Educational Research and Research and Methods Division." A guy named Harold Fakey was his PhD at at uh, Notre Dame. He became. He and I worked on this plan to change the name to Educational Methods Division. Of course, oh, how appropriate. We suddenly had the biggest division, still the largest division, they have their own programs and so on. Uh, and they triple in with I triple and they have a frontiers of education. I remember the first, the third conference in engineering and education on the frontier. We call it frontiers in education. First meeting was Georgia Tech, maybe a hundred people there. The third meeting we met here, we had thousands of people signed up to go to that thing. And we knew we were on the right track for something. Of course, now that's changed a lot. And our old freshman engineering department now changed their name. They were first a department, then a division of engineering, now they're a school uh, of engineering education. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was just freshman engineering now, very few of the faculty do constantly, all we always are faculty. It's a very large operation. I was over there today, they have a huge building, they have a big staff, have a lot of faculty members that are giving PhDs in engineering education. Sure. So something that was Dean Hawkins' dream that it was maybe a little grad assistant and now, <laughs> now has about eight or ten professors and they're all doing cutting edge wonderful work right, yeah. going on. It's just right. beyond me. Right. Um, any other awards or honors that you wanted that you could share with the researcher? You got you were a commissioner for the Engineering Workforce Commission at one time. Yeah, well, uh, I still serve on that committee. Uh, because of my health, I wasn't able to go to the meetings the last year or two. But this year I'm going to start and going. But it's was it called originally called the Engineering Manpower Commission. We thought that was too sexist. So we had to fight that battle to change the Engineering Workforce Commission. A lot of people thought, oh, well, what's, you know, there's all oh, like any changes. Whatever. But what we did there is I did some work on the utilization of engineers. I did a lot of surveys of graduates from that. As part of the goals of engineering education, we did a study of graduates, engineering graduates around the country. And when I came back to Purdue, Dean Hawkins wanted me to do a study of engineering. I said, let's do science students, and then let's not look at just bachelor degrees, but master's and PhDs. I said, what about those people that graduated in the Depression? And women engineers, what are they doing? So in our study for engineering education, a big, thick report, we got data on what all those people were doing. Very good. And we did bachelor's, master's in science, in, in engineering and in science. And we also got all what women engineers were doing and what people in the, during the Depression. They'd taken the strong interest tests we're doing. We, we had a lot of research studies. Or in my archives. Yeah, that's good. This is there, but that was fun. I guess what I think I remember most about Purdue is that was uh, something I always got up every morning. One of my most important things, you know, after 50 years here, I had a they had a retirement party for me, and I remember that was the one that was wonderful. I remember. I started off with Carolyn Perucci was the first speaker, and she talked about the work I had done to get her on a fellowship. At that time, I didn't think women should get fellowships, doctoral fellowships, because they were just going to get married and everything. And then uh, another person was uh, Jim, who I worked with. He had the best sense of humor and thing. So I made a lot of laughs, we got together. Jim always does a great job in that. And then Dean, uh, was a Dean uh, of Engineering, he talked about work we had done with placement and particularly about the strong interest in engineering. Mm -hmm. 
that we had changed into a PIC Purdue Interest Questionnaire. It was very gratifying. And my daughter told me about how she watched me. I always thought she should have been, and she's a lawyer now, but she always thought that the analytical things that she got with me was always very helpful to her. Sure, right. Do you have a, a favorite Purdue tra tradition when you think back on it? Any tradition that Purdue's that sticks in your mind? Well, I think one that they threw away well, I liked the best, and that was the one where you said, to have beanies, all the freshmen had to wear green beanies, and they threw that one away. That's one I, I still uh, like Purdue forever. I guess is what I would say. That's my yeah. That's good. That's yeah. Good. Any closing comments, Bill, that you'd like to share with us that you come to mind? Well, okay? I just think I hope everybody could be as fortunate as I was to see 50 years what happened to Purdue. Not only is the buildings change. The students have changed. They're a lot more committed now to not just getting their math and getting a job. They're committed to helping people. I think the uh, fact that we have international students and international faculty would become really a comprehensive university. I think Dean Hubbard would look back and find us what he was able to do. And Dean Parr would look back too. He would say, well, you know, we still get turn out people to get things done. Right. And that's certainly true of Purdue. Mm -hmm. I just love the place. It's been a wonderful experience. Good. Thank you, Bill. This concludes it. Thank you very much.